to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock, the President and Executive Director of Emerald Planet and Director and Host of Emerald Planet TV. We come to you on a weekly basis to bring you the best practices that we've been able to identify in over 144 different nations, looking for those thousand best practices, which are the technologies, the services, and the products that are helping us as we move through the 21st century. And looking at uh, moving to 2050 and how we're gonna be able to take care of a planet which then will have about nine billion souls to provide the food, the fuel, the fiber, the basic infrastructure, and of course the education, health care, transportation, everything that we need to put all this together. And we have a gentleman that's going to be joining us that's looking at all these various issues and under the theme of resiliency. This is Dr. Thomas Houlihan. He is a consultant from the Alternative Petroleum Technologies Organization. He's coming in by Skype out of Reno, Nevada. And we have right beside me our good friend and uh, buddy, uh, Charles H. Botwick, who is the Managing Director for the Dulles Tech and Trade Center. And he's the Skype backup uh, for this. So if we lose Tom off of uh, Skype, then Chuck and I are gonna continue right along and keep chatting away. But Tom, welcome to the Emerald Planet. How do you do? Well, we're certainly glad to have you. And uh, give us a, a brief overview of your global organization. It's called the Alternative Petroleum Technologies. And why is such a curious name? Well, Alternative Petroleum Technologies is a advanced fuel development company located in Reno, Nevada, the biggest little city in the world. And we like to think of our technology as the biggest little technology in the world. In the sense that we add water to oil, all forms of oil, to make it burn better. So for instance, we are the only fuel technology, emulsified diesel fuel technology that has been verified by the EPA and has been certified by the California Air Resources Board. Well, uh, we're, we're really glad to have you here, Tom, and to uh, talk about this. But we're talking about this resiliency and something that you brought to our, our attention is this resiliency capacity index. And we have actually the slide of that up on the screen behind us. So what is the RCI and what does it may mean as far as recovery of uh, various communities around the globe that actually have some catastrophic uh, environmental or economic stress or may undergo some kind of uh, natural disaster? The RCI, the Resiliency Capacity Index, was developed by Dr. Catherine Foster, who was a MacArthur Fellow at the University of Buffalo, my old hometown. And it was released in 2011, and it's based essentially on 12 socioeconomic factors, the ones that are shown in the slide. And it measures the capability of a uh, area or a region to essentially rebound from a disaster. We think of resilience as we do with a rubber band. You pull a rubber band and it goes back to its original form. It's resilient. So essentially what we're looking at is a situation where the area suffers a disaster, man-made or natural, and is can come back to essentially a living form not necessarily as complete as before, but not in complete devastation. Well, looking at these uh, 12 areas that you're talking about, Tom, and uh, this cuts across uh, the local level and communities at the regional uh, level, maybe counties, uh, larger uh, metropolitan complexes, and all the way up to states and even uh, nations, depending on the size. How do you balance uh, between these different areas so that you actually enhance the resiliency of these communities, even though uh, these may be uh, low asset or low performing areas, and at the same time, they may be uh, stressed already? 
and then you add this uh, natural disaster or uh, this uh, climate change impact on top of the stresses they already have. Well, the thing to notice, Sam, is that in the factors that are put forth for consideration in this RCI, there are no physical measurements. And that's one of the aspects that we were trying to bring forth with regards to the technology. There's a new technology that is just brewing called the Internet of Things. And this is developed from the fact that we now have very smart sensors that can be deployed globally. And when I say smart, unlike before, they can tell you where they are in addition to tell you what they are measuring. So that in this case, unlike the socioeconomic factors that were applied to determine RCI before, what we're looking at is a situation where you can deploy a full suite of all of the necessary sensors, temperature, pressure, emission factors, et cetera, et cetera, so that you can characterize a community you can essentially flex the community's response to a disaster, improve the community's response, and hopefully overcome any kind of severe destruction. Well, we're talking about the areas that actually uh, low, maybe uh, low asset, low performing uh, areas and going through this stress, but if you have a community that's labeled as high or very high as far as resiliency, uh, is it easier for them to recover under a large-scale environmental and economic stress or is there special conditions that must be addressed regardless of whether it's uh, very high, high, medium, or low resiliency? Again, when you're looking at the present situation where you have the economic factors that are put forth the social interactions that are put forth to measure, say, the capability of the region to respond, there is no guarantee that the resources within that community are going to respond. It may be a situation where they would like to, but the, say, teleconference facilities or the communication facilities are down, which is a technology base. And therefore, what we're putting forth is the fact that now, in addition to the determinations that have been made from a broad-based point of view, you now can go in and look more perceptively at the situation that the technology can give you a better picture of. Well, looking at uh, all of the uh, this uh, wonderful information, Tom, that you shared with us, I know that uh, we jumped ahead just a little bit, but uh, as you know, we have uh, Charles Botwick. He goes by Chuck, Managing Director of the Dulles Tech and Trade Center, who is a good friend of yours. And I'm going to let him uh, ask the next question as it relates to this IOT. Chuck? Hi, Tom. Wonderful to uh, have you here with us. Uh, Thanks, Chuck. In terms of the Internet of Things, this is very interesting uh, evolution in terms of how it may play out for resiliency in the future in terms of sensors and, and feedback of information. Uh, how, how, tell us a little bit more about what this really means and how it can play into uh, further research for resilience. What it is, Chuck, is the fact that, again, we have a suite of instrumentation that can not only tell you what it is designed to tell you, i.e. here's the temperature at this particular spot, but it also can tell you here I am, this is exactly where I am GPS wise. So for instance, <clears throat> the European Union has a quote test city in Santander, Spain, where they have embedded sensors in the pavement that can tell you what the flow of traffic is. Hmm. They can tell you if there's a backup. They can tell you if there's a stand down. And in addition to that, they can also give you the emissions uh, levels within the area. So if there is indeed a problem hmm. 
it can put forth the fact that this is an area to avoid in your transport and just as well it can alert people to go to emergency situations so it this is, is a, a real time uh, this is a real time feedback uh, some people call it cybernetics uh, in a way what you're getting is uh, what they call for the human body proprioception you're getting real time information about your situation exactly and from that point of view now you have in my mind's eye a perfect opportunity a first of all to put the sensors in the proper positions so that you can fully characterize a region secondly you can flex the sensors just for a response as is Thirdly, you can take a look at a situation where you would like to change some things, i.e., let's look at the increasing the response time so that we locate the fire station here rather than there for the majority of problem areas. And finally, you can prepare the area to again account for a incoming disaster, both man-made as well as one that is caused by nature, so that the response can be not only predicted, but also sustained. Tom, we're about ready to run out of time. As you know, we never really have enough time to uh, get over all aspects of the uh, topic. But what do you see as far as your organization, the Alternative Petroleum Technologies, and uh, this IOT, the Internet of Things, how is that going to help shape the future? And we only have about 30 seconds. What we're looking at, very frankly, right now is uh, operations in China. We've been uh, very intensely involved in alleviating their emission situation. Tom, we got 15 more seconds and then we got to be out. And from that point of view, we're trying to combine both IoT as well as our advanced technology with regards to emulsified fuel. Well, thank you very much. This is Tom uh, Houlihan, who is a consultant for the Alternative Petroleum Technologies, and Charles H. Botwick, who is the managing director of the Dulles Tech and uh, Trade Center. And it's always great to have you with us, thank uh, you Chuck. Much. Thank you Enjoyed for being with us. And uh, Tom, thank you for being with us. And thank you, uh, dear viewer, for being with us as we look around the globe to create the Emerald Planet.